Episode 78, Brian Henry. Before we get started today, I'd like to let you know about our all-new coaching program. If you need help in the areas within the government contracting space, we now offer coaching. We have helped people set up FDA-registered PPE factories, SBIR, STTR submissions, new invention slash technology delivery for CSO, BAA, and OTA, RFI responses, proposal writing for IDIQs, and facilitated 8A sole source contracts in the tens of millions. Currently, we have more than 10 coaches and instructors on staff available to help. If there's something that you believe you need in order to effectively put the best practices into action, visit our website, govconscience.com slash pricing page for programs that may benefit and serve your best needs. Learn from contracting officers, specialists, and practitioners. Now back to today's episode. I didn't have a lot of experience, but I had knowledge. Right. But one thing in business, um, not to um, go sidetrack, but I was speaking with a big contractor, Consigli, in this area. And um, we were discussing a contract. And, you know, I said, um, you know, I really ha- wish I had more um, hands-on experience. And the gentleman said, you know, Brian, hands-on experience is nice, but the level you're at, you need to know how to run your business. Knowledge of your business and growing your business is more important than you slinging a hammer at this point. You've outgrown that. So one thing about construction is that you don't know have to know everything, but the people in your company has to know. So at the end of the day, you surround yourself around people that are going to help you grow. That's not always easy. Some come, some go. But the core of your business the people that are surrounding you is really important. And I have a good group of guys. Welcome to the GovCon Giants podcast, federal contracting for people on the outside looking in. If you are here to learn how to win a piece of the pie without getting your face smashed in, then you've tuned in to the right place. Now, the giant that not only walks the walk, but talks the talk, your host, Eric Coffey. Today, we have a special guest, Mr. Brian Henry, president of Henry General Contractors, who was a former truck driver turned multi-million dollar general contractor. His journey began as a dump truck operator when a good friend approached him about doing more. The business owner was a former employer of his cousin and asked Brian who's going to be the next MBE in the area. Realizing that his time spent sitting in the dump truck waiting on loads could be more effectively used managing projects and teams, Brian set out to get his construction supervisor's license. Eventually, he worked his way up into the 8A program and four years later had surpassed the $10 million annual revenue mark. In today's story, we share Brian's lessons learned from his father, the trial and errors of running a business, valuable lessons from building a multi-million dollar business, speaking with multi-billion dollar executives, how he views a general contractor as a traffic director, and much, much more. This is an eye-opening episode to listen for those of you who may want to pivot markets for those who believe they are stuck in one particular area, and for those persons looking for direction. Brian was first introduced to me by one of our GovCon EDU students. I remember meeting him in Florida at a National Parks event where he attended and we discussed his ambitions. He's a regular guy who decided that he wanted more out of life. I think that we could all relate to that. Stay tuned for this week's giant, Mr. Brian Henry. I'd like to welcome today, Mr. Brian Henry. Brian? Good morning, how are you doing? Doing great. And yourself? We're doing great. We're doing great. What's the name of your company? Henry General Contractors, Inc. Okay. And you're based out of Springfield, Mass? Yes, we're located in Springfield, Massachusetts. We work out of the SBA office of Boston. We're an 8A certified contractor. Um, and we're in our f- sixth year. Okay. Okay. Now, uh, I've, again, I've, I've had the privilege of talking to you offline, but even before the interview, and I understand your background, you were a truck driver. Yes, um, we started out, actually, um, I, was, I started out as an electronic technician. I moved to Springfield back in 1982. Okay. And I worked for an aerospace company, and, you know, things were good. And then the economy went bad. So at that point, um, I got laid off. And I wanted to go into construction. So didn't have a lot of construction background. But at the end of the day, um, it's something that I thought would be lucrative as well as um, I would be able to provide for my family. So I got involved in trucking. And in the process of um, working on construction, 
projects, you know, I really thought that there was an opportunity for me to start doing more than what I was doing. So we launched off um, Henry General Contractors. I got my construction supervisor's license because I've had, I've done construction in the past, but not on a professional level. So I got my construction supervisor's license and um, I started pursuing contracts in the nonprofit arena. We started building houses. We started um, doing renovations, um, things of that nature, and just growing and learning. Um, I started picking up, um, you know, good help, good people in the field. And that's how we launched off Henry General Contractors. Okay. Um, the reason why I ask is because, believe it or not, I have so many people that are out there that are former truck drivers or current truck drivers. And you're the first person that I've met that made a transition from trucking to contracting and construction. Um, a lot of people want to remain in trucking and build a big trucking business. Why didn't you take that route? Well, I wanted to, um, I bought a dump truck. So okay. basically the dump truck was on construction projects uh, and I rented okay. my truck to construction companies. So, you're sitting in a truck, you're watching all this construction going on, and you're thinking to yourself, how can I expand what I'm doing and grow into something that, you know, I would be proud of as well as my kids would be proud of. So I'm thinking and I'm watching and, you know, years are going by. And finally, I got to the point where I said, okay, you know, I'm either going to do something now or I'm not going to do anything at all. So I had a good friend um, who would try to encourage me. He would talk to me and say, hey, Brian, you know, you can do more than just sit in that truck. Um, there's opportunities out there for you. Um, there's more opportunities for you than there is for me. So he would just encourage me. And, and I still didn't have a plan or a path to transition from, from being in construction, driving a dump truck to starting a construction company. Mm. So at the end of the day, I said, well, I'm going to start taking steps. So the first thing is to get my construction supervisor's license in Massachusetts. You need a license to be able to pull permits and um, do projects that are um, inspected by the different agencies. So I got my construction supervisor's license. So then I'm saying to myself, now what? So at the time, me and my brother were building a house to sell. So I um, supervised the whole project. And we built it and we sold it. So I went to the nonprofit and I started bidding contracts. So um, at the end of the day, um, they wanted contractors to be pre-qualified. So they said, show me your past projects. So I presented to them this house that I built. So they say, okay, that's, that's along the lines that, you know, the type of projects we're doing. So that's how I got my first shot. Mm. And then it just evolved from there. We started building three, four, five houses at once. We started renovating two, three, four, five houses at once. But at the end of the day, that market dried up. Okay. Okay. Now you said the friend of yours that encouraged you to do more. What was he thinking about in terms of you? Did he, did he see something in you? What, what would, what do you think that was? Well, he was, um, I had a cousin that worked for him back in the seventies. So, um, we created that friendship based on, you know, um, him knowing my cousin and he was a white contractor okay. and he's just, I guess he saw in me, Brian, who's going to be the next, um, MBE in this area. Mm -hmm. You know, you right. have the potential to do it. Um, you can do more than what you're doing. Um, there's more opportunities out there. So he, he just took a liking to me right. and um, we started talking and he basically said, I don't have the answer as far as how you're going to do it. But all I can tell you is that you need to do it mm -hmm. because basically he said, you know, you're a subcontractor for me. Um, I'm only going to pay you so much money, but I can help you that you can make your own money. Wow. So that was kind of inspirational, inspirational because, you know, most people really don't 
talk right. to you in that way. You know, they got right. you in a certain place and they want to keep you there. Absolutely. But um, that's really the conversation that we had. And it just kept lingering in my mind. And finally, I said, you know, I got to do something. Is that person still around? Is the guy yes, still he around? is. Oh, really? And he? Um, he, he's still around and he's still thriving. And, um, you know, we've worked, a, we've worked on different projects um, in the 8A arena. You know, I've subcontracted to him. Nice. Um, nice. We're still friends. And, um, you know, I really appreciate everything he's done for me. What does he think about your success now? He says it's great. It's great. But Brian is, you know, we know this is going to come to an end. So right. you always have to um, um, concentrate on what are you going to do when you get out of 8A. Right, right, right. And, so and the clock, the clock ticks fast. <laughs> Nine years may seem like a, a long time, but the clock ticks fast. Uh, on that same topic, what do you say about people who want to just get in 8A and they've never done any projects at all? Well, the 8A program is a great program. And it's not a startup program. I mean, the government expects you to have some type of experience in construction, but when you're in the program, you know, most of the contract officers try to work with you. And, you know, they give you certain leniencies that they don't necessarily give someone that's in the competitive market. So um, it's a business development program. So it's designed to develop your business so that when you get out of the program, that you can continue to thrive and be a successful business. So working with your um, business opportunity specialist is key. Um, Boston, we have a great um, SBA office and, you know, they really try to help you and try to guide you so that you will be successful when you get out. Um, I can't say enough about the 8A program and there's many opportunities that are afforded for whatever socioeconomic um, category you're in. And at the end of the day, um, I've seen people use the program greatly and I've seen the people not use the program at all. Hmm. Uh, now, and we, and you and I didn't discuss that, but before we continue on that path, can we just talk about like little Brian, uh, when you were a kid, did you, were you an entrepreneur as a kid or a child growing up? Well, I grew up in North Florida um, and I grew up in a town called Green Coast Springs, it's, you know, south of Jacksonville. And I had, you know, parents that were old school. My father was born in 1919 and, you know, he was very old fashioned. So when I was born, you know, my father was 45 years old, so he already had gray hair, but he had a great work ethic. He was, a, you know, he was a school teacher, but um, I would see him do all different type of projects. He had real estate property, he had like five houses. So I would see him go and, you know, he'd go over there and paint, then he'd be putting tar on the roof and then he'd be fixing plumbing and doing all these type of things. So my father had the mindset that it was nothing that you couldn't do if you put your mind to it. So at the end of the day, um, growing up under that type of upbringing, you know, I always felt that, you know, if I could, if I put my mind to it, I could do it. Construction wasn't something that um, was on my agenda. When I was a kid, I wanted to be an electronic technician. But at the end of the day, when I was laid off, I said, this is my opportunity to start my business in construction. And via through trucking, I bought a dump truck and things just started to grow from there. I didn't launch into construction, you know, um, coming from a background where my parents were in construction. Um, it was kind of, I had knowledge of construction and it was, um, let's just grow on what we know and continue to grow and continue to grow. Okay. No, that makes sense. That makes sense. So um, now, again, when you said you launched into it, even when you were buying that first house to fix up that house, how, what gave you the confidence to, to do that, to, to take a risk, take a chance? Well, when I was in trucking, um, I bought a piece of land and I hired a contractor to build my house and I watched them and I would go there every day and I would watch, you know, when I, when I finished work, at 3.30, 4 o'clock, I would always go visit to see what type of progress was made. And I would watch the, um, the contractor and, you know, 
I just felt that, you know, what he was doing, I said, this guy, he's a traffic director. <laughs> um, he's basically a briefcase. He's basically a um, checkbook and he has knowledge of construction. And I said to myself, well, why can't I build houses? Why can't I do this? Why can't I do this um, in my spare time? So it got to the point where I said, you know, I could do this. And that's when um, I decided to build a house. After my house was built, I decided to build another house and sell it. And um, I had already acquired my construction supervisor's license and I had knowledge of construction. I didn't have a lot of experience, but I had knowledge. Right. But one thing in business, um, not to um, go sidetrack, but I was speaking with a big contractor, Consigli, in this area. And um, we were discussing a contract. And, you know, I said, um, you know, I really ha wish I had more um, hands-on experience. And the gentleman said, you know, Brian, hands-on experience is nice, but the level you're at, you need to know how to run your business. Knowledge of your business and growing your business is more important than you slinging a hammer at this point. You've outgrown that. So um, one thing about construction is that you don't know have to know everything, but the people in your company has to know. So at the end of the day, um, you surround yourself around people that are gonna help you grow. That's not always easy. Some come, some go, but the core of your business, the people that are surrounding you is really important. And I have a good group of guys. That's, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. Now, I know we talked about as you were going through, you're building the houses, you start meeting more and more people, you start bringing people on board. I, I know that oftentimes uh, when, we, when we, again, you were laid off. So when you first start, it's maybe one or two of you. And then you start going, you know, three, four, five, six, seven people. At what point did you start hiring other people? Well, when I got 8A certified, it was just me and another guy. It was two people. Okay. And um, What year was that? That was um, 2015. 2014. 15? Okay. So when I got certified, it was just two people. And um, I knew that that wasn't enough. So... The first year we got a couple contracts. We subbed a lot of work out and we brought on a project manager because the gentleman I had, he was working out in the field and I would be in the office doing all the, the paperwork, the SF 1413s, all the different paperwork, the RFIs, doing the submittals, you know, I was just doing everything. And the second year, I would say we started ramping up, just getting more and more people. So at the end of the day, you're always conscious of budgets and, you know, right. can I carry this person? And, you know, um, this person is going to need a pickup truck and all these, you know, we're going to need equipment. So you just try to manage and grow at a level where, you know, you're comfortable and, you know, you stick your neck out a little further than you're comfortable, but it's all a part of growth. So I would say the first three years was a, was a, big growth period as far as bringing on people and trying to get the right team to um, be successful. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, did you, because again, I know that you did, you took the, the class to learn in terms of having your license for uh, construction, but what about any other type of training for HR and hiring similar to what the, the person from Consigli said, how did you learn to run a business? Where did you get that? information wisdom from? I would say trial and error. Um, <laughs> I, I, I didn't have a business background, but um, one of my common goals was to be fair to people. And, you know, you put your expectations out there um, and you pay a person a, a competitive salary and then there's accountability. I'm going to be accountable on my part. I want you to be accountable on your part. So we build a team, we build a relationship. And as I said before, I really didn't have a lot of experience in business and in back, a background as far as business, but I just felt that, you know, being fair, I treat someone the way you would want to be treated. You know, um, you can't run off with all the money. Um, at the end of the day, 
um, acknowledge people for their accomplishments, acknowledge them, make them feel comfortable. This is a team effort. And let's just grow and see what we can see how far we can go. And um, I have a good group of people and um, we're continuously looking for um, good people. That's interesting. The, the, a lot of the things that you mention are, and, and a lot of these standard entrepreneurship and business books, and you seem to have run across these, these insights just kind of uh, uh, through, I don't want to say instinctively, but almost uh, like you said, through trial and error, but just through uh, being in business and having to, I, I don't know, I don't, I don't know where it came from. Maybe your dad? Yeah, I would say my, my mother and father. I mean, okay. my father was born in 1919. My mother was born in 1927. So they were very old fashioned. You know, my father grew up on a farm. He made it to the eighth grade. He had to drop out of school to help the family. At that point, once he um, finished helping out the family, he went into the military. World War II, when he got out of the military, he went to Bethune-Cookman College on an eighth grade education. Um, he graduated and he became a um, school teacher. So my father wasn't a person of a lot of excuses because, you know, look, looking at his background and, you know, he could have had a lot of excuses um, to be unsuccessful. Mm-hmm. But he chose when the cards were dealt with him, he made choices to advance his lifestyle. So he always instilled that into me and my brother. And at the end of the day, um, I use those same ethics to try to um, instill in my family as well as um, my employees. Did you uh, did you go to attend a university? I went to a community college. I went to a a community college in Springfield, Springfield Technical Community College. Um, I took up industrial electronics. And from there, I went to work at a company in Connecticut. now, how did you get from uh, North Florida up to Springfield? Well, my father, like I said, both of my parents were teachers. So my father had a brother that lived in Springfield. So since they had the summers off, um, we would come visit every summer. So um, 18 years of coming to Springfield comparing to where I grew up at <laughs> in a small town and just spending two weeks in the summer in Springfield um, when I graduated. I felt that there were more opportunities in Massachusetts than what was afforded to me in Florida. Oh, that's, that's, that's really neat. Um, I didn't know that story. And I've still never heard of Green Coast Springs. Well, it's 30 miles South of Jacksonville and um, you know, it's a one horse town, but I appreciate um, growing up there. I didn't when I was growing up there, but Mm. now I can see all those, hometown qualities that you don't really see in the city, but um, that's where I grew up. I spent 18 years there and I moved to Springfield and I've been here ever since. Now let's put some timelines to this because um, I'm looking at the the date where it says you found your company from the date that you got 8A, from the date you start working on projects. Can we put some timelines just to make, have people have a a aware situationally of what we're talking about. So it looks like, again, and I'm looking at the records, it says you were founded your company in 1992? Yes, we started um, Henry's Trucking in 1992. Okay, there you go. Um, And from 1992 to 2002, it was trucking. So in 2002, that's when I transitioned from Henry's Trucking into Henry General Contractors. We started taking taking on small projects. working on the state level as a minority business enterprise, um, working on the city with nonprofits, doing um, different housing projects, um, working with the state as far as capital asset management, doing small state projects. So from that point, things were thriving all the way up until I would say probably 2012, 2013, you know, um, things in this area slowed down tremendously. And that's when I decided to um, apply for 8A. Um, So we put our application in, you know, 
um, one of the biggest issues with applying for 8A is a complete application. So if your application is not complete, um, they will um, turn it down for being incomplete. So that happened twice. So around 2014, I put in an application that was accepted. So I'm sitting around, I'm kind of waiting, waiting to hear back from them, you know, making phone calls. Nobody's returning my phone calls and things are getting very slow. Um, it's me in the office and then I have a gentleman, I told you the other guy, he's working out in the field. So I'm just trying to keep things busy. So one morning I went to the office and I, I decided, you know what, I'm gonna drive down to King of Prussia where my application was submitted my 8 application. It's been about six months, seven months. I haven't mm -hmm. heard anything. So I took that drive. It was four hours. So um, I got there about one o'clock and I introduced myself and the gentleman said, the lady that is handling your application is um, out to lunch, but she'll be back shortly. Just have a seat and, and you know, maybe she'll talk to you. So she walked in. She didn't know I was there. She walked in and um, the receptionist introduced me and she just stared at me. And um, she said, come into my office. So I came into my office and I looked on her desk and there was my application sitting there. Wow. So up until this point, we've had no communication except your application is being processed. So she said she had a couple questions. She asked me a couple of questions. She said, you have a pretty complete um, application. Um, she gave me a couple of things to go back and work on. She had like three questions. Go work on these questions and give me an answer. So I immediately went back to Springfield and the next day I worked on them. And I would say within two weeks, I was accepted into the program. That's a great story. So, um, that was, um, it was kind of peculiar that that day I went there and the application was just sitting right on her desk. That, that, that must have made you feel really good. It did because, you know, you got a lot of states, you know, you know, you figure from Maine down to New Jersey or Pennsylvania, all the ADA applications goes to King of Prussia. And that's the district office for this area. And I mean, she had many applications, but it would just so happen that I got there on the right day. That's incredible. So, uh, but my thing is, you, you do have to fight. I felt I spoke with some other eight eight contractors that graduated, and they told me that you know when things are slow, you know you might have to take a drive and go to your district office and see where your application sits. Mm. You know, sometimes that helps speed speed up the process. I talked to two um, contractors that graduated that did 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 the same thing. Okay. All right. Now, so that, I mean, that's, that's a, uh, brings us to another point. So you actually spoke to 8A graduates before you got into the program. Exactly. Um, when I was working with the nonprofits and just working from the state and local level, I seen, I knew of um, two 8A contractors that was successful. So, you know, I talked to them about the program and, you know, just trying to get some information and, you know, sometimes you get information that you want to hear and sometimes you get information that you don't want to hear. So um, they just basically told me what the program was about, the do's and the don'ts. And, you know, they told me it was a great program, but um, your work history really speaks for you. He said one job, one bad job can change, you know, many things. So it's best to put your best foot forward, give them the best possible job you can, um, be competitive, and at the same time, you know, um, take care of your customers' needs, you know. You may have to do a little extra. You may have to, you know, go the extra mile, but it's going to pay off. And that, that theory worked for me, you know. I try to stay competitive. I try to give them the best, you know, I give them what they're looking for. And then I try to give them a little beyond. And at the end of the day, um, it'll definitely help you while you're in the program and contracting officers, they communicate. So, you know, good news travels, bad news travels faster. So, um, 
just putting the best foot forward and um, meeting your customer needs is, is, is key. Can you give me an example of where you've gone beyond the contract? Well, I had a paving project in Hartford and um, we completed the paving. It was a paving and concrete project. And I was actually running a job myself. So every day I would just look at, you know, this little, they had some little landscaping out front. So the mulch was all dried up. It was weedy. It was, it was just, it, it really took away from my paving job. Mm. You know, it wasn't in the contract, but I removed the mulch. I got all the weeds out. I put in new mulch and I landscaped it and made it look nice. And the contracting officer, as well as the um, person that was in charge of the project, he was so impressed. And he said, Brian, I like you, and I'm going to continue to give you projects. Right. And to this day, um, he has definitely ramped up tremendously. And it's just things, small things like that um, that really um, sets your business apart from other businesses. I am. Um yeah, no, that's a great example. Love it. I love it. The um, and it pays how many fold? Right. We we we've probably done six contracts after that. Consistent. Mm -hmm. by, wow. by the time we finish one, there's always one in the queue. Wow. Are you interested in this? Are you interested in that? So, um, but the work we did, um, I must say, in that scenario, the concrete was designed to be done in two different pours and the job was kind of complicated because you can only work on the weekend. You couldn't work Monday through Friday. We get there at like Friday and we work till noontime on Sunday. It was all after hours. So we had a pour and the pour was designed to be completed in two Saturdays Do half this Saturday, half this Saturday. So my subcontractor came to me and said, hey, Brian, I want to pour it all today. So I said, you can do it, but you're going to own it. He said, I'll own it. So we had that discussion Friday. We set up the pour on Saturday. So they poured the concrete on Saturday. And at the end of the day, it was hotter than they expected. And the concrete cured super fast. And the product just came out. It, it was unacceptable. So we met that Monday and we discussed what, what are our options? So the person in charge gave us time to go over with my subcontractor to see what direction we're going to go. So I listened to my subcontractor and I'm like, that's unacceptable. I said, we're going to have to pull this thing out and we're going to have to pour it again. And he said, okay. So I went to my, um, to my um, inspector and I said, Hey, we're going to pull it out and we're going to pour it again. He said, Brian, that's the right answer. And just by us doing that, it allowed the opportunity for us to show that, you know, we're going to stick to what we're, when it costs money, we're still going to hold up to our contract. I was looking at your profile and I noticed that you had done a project over at Sandy Hook. Yes. Okay. Was that following a disaster? Yes. Okay. Yes, it was a it was a disaster project. Okay. Um, talk, talk about it. So basically, we had a contract to um, rebuild some concession stands and revamp the damage that was done in a storm called Hurricane Sandy. And um, it was, I was just getting into the 8A program. I probably had a year under my belt. And it was it a was, um, project that was presented by the National Park Service. So I hadn't had any experience working out of state. So I teamed up with an 8A contractor that had graduated that was familiar with working in that area. And the project was a little over $2 million. And it was my first experience working out of state and work in New Jersey is probably three hours from where we're at in Springfield. So I teamed up with the um, graduate and um, in 8A program, you have to perform 15% self-performance as a, 
as a as a minimum. And we went and we performed the contract. Um, it was a challenge because um, I've never worked that far, but working with a um, person that's been in the program is a great thing to do. Um, teaming up with someone that has graduated, someone that was successfully graduated um, was one of the better choices when I first started out. So okay. um, a lot of times we don't, you know, feel that we can work with another contractor that's graduated, but I did. And I think it was a great choice. Okay. Okay. No, that's, uh, is that, was that one of the tips that you would give someone that was starting out an 8A program? Yes. I, I would definitely tell you to take guidance from a 8A contractor that was successful. Um, there's a lot of things that information they can give you that you won't make the same mistake. Um, they're, there's so many different aspects of 8A. It's marketing. Um, it's um, self-performance. It's it's um, giving the um, customer what they're looking for, giving them a quality product. Um, they can guide you. They can tell you the do's and don'ts. And I just think it was very helpful for me to team up with this, this graduate. Now, how did you find that person? Um, I knew of them. I knew of them. I knew that they were in the 8A program. I didn't know they had graduated. So one day I was um, driving and um, I saw, I knew where their office was and I drove by and I saw a, a vehicle parked there. So I said, let me just stop in and say hello and tell them who I am and um, just ask for some advice um, because I knew they were successful. And, and we spoke and they offered to help me. So um, I thought that was very interesting and I thought that was very nice. So um, one of the things that the gentleman said, he says, Brian, I'll help you, but um, there's only one thing. Don't steal my help. And I said, that's not a problem. I wouldn't steal your help because I wouldn't want anybody to steal my help. So we teamed up and um, he made contacts to some of the old contract officers he had worked for and um, contracts started coming our way and we teamed up on many different projects and it allowed us to get a jump start. You know, the first year, second year can be difficult because, you know, mostly there's a lot of marketing involved. So we were marketing as well as we um, acquired contracts in our first and second year. So um, considerable contracts. So I think that was a great move and um, I would recommend anybody to um, team up with a um, successful a day graduate or even one that's in a program that's willing to work with you. Right. Right. Uh, when he said don't steal his help, what do you mean by that? I, I'm not, I guess I wasn't sure. Well, the what workers? happens is, okay, he's graduated. Yeah. His workers. Right. And it's not even his workers. Um, sometimes it's office help. You key people, your project manager, mm. your estimator. Okay. He's graduating. So now he's in the real world and the contracts may not be coming. Um, as fast as he, he'd like. But now you're up and coming um, 8A contract. You're in your first year. So at the end of the day, sometime administrative people will jump the fence and say, okay, this guy got another nine years. I've made all these contacts. Um, um, I'm going to switch teams. That's not uncommon in this particular arena. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, um, I wouldn't steal nobody's help and I wouldn't want anybody to steal my help. So I told him that that's not a problem. And he trusted you and he believed you. He trusted me. And, and I'm going to be truthful with you. Some of his people did ask, did try to talk to me and, you know, try to consider um, switching teams. And I told uh -huh. him, no, that's, that's, that's unacceptable. So he knew what he was talking about. Right. Right. I right, didn't he, think too much of it when yeah. he said it. I'm like, Oh, that's no problem. I'm, yeah, I'm that's not going to that. happen. Right. But, um, a couple, I would say two, um, came and spoke to me and I'm like, no, that's not, you know, first of all, I wouldn't do that anyway, but number two, um, um, I made a pact that I wouldn't do that. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, no, that's good. do you remember the, the first agency that gave you a contract? Yes, it was, um, the air force. Okay. Okay. It was, um, it was local. It's only five miles up the road, Westover air phase. Westover Air Force Base. It was a small contract. Well, it was for, I think, two hundred and seventy thousand. Mm -hmm. End up, a couple change orders got up to like three hundred thirty-eight, I think. But 
it was it was the right contract because you're not gonna um we didn't jump out the box with big two and three million dollar contracts um the person the contract officer at Westover was very familiar with the 8A program. She had been there for 20 years, so she just wanted to see and start you in a job that she felt comfortable that you could handle based on, you know, the experience that you presented to her. And she didn't set me up for failure. Great. That's good. That's good. I think a lot of people do see those, the big numbers, right? And they think that that's where they should start or for whatever reason. Um, and like you said, based on experience of working the programs, sometimes you can set someone up for failure by starting them off at too high of a level. Right. And, you know, we've done $2 million contracts at Westover. I mean, we've grown it gradually. Um, the contracts got bigger and bigger and more thorough. So, um, and we continue to work with them to this day. Okay. That was going to be my next question. Now, yeah. So, um, currently we just finished the, um, um, we did some work at the air traffic control tower. Um, we did some electrical upgrades as well, as well as we did some, um, exterior, um, paneling work. So, um, and we're going to be doing a, um, canopy at one of their buildings. So that's our next project at Westover. A now, project. how do you go about vetting your subcontractors and the people that you hire to do these projects? Well, in the beginning, you know, you talk to them about their experience and have they have, the first question is, have you ever um, done any federal work? So um, that's question number one. And then you talk to the other con you talk to other contractors basically and find out, you know, is this guy good? Is this guy bad? You know, like I said, I got the 8A graduate who um I speak to when it comes to subcontractors, but um at the end of the day, um sometimes you just get a good feeling about them and the key is when you're in this program, you want to use people that's going to make you good, make you look good. So um, once we develop a team of contractors, subcontractors that we use, um, we go to them often. But we do mix it up. We just don't go to the same guy all the time. We we um, we put it out for bid, and um, we basically keep it competitive because you don't want to get comfortable using the same contractor because then the prices rise and that makes you less competitive. So mm. um, we try to keep a good pool of subcontractors and um, your name goes with you. What, what would you say? Okay. Are you still doing state and local work as well? Um, no, we focus mostly, we work in the private arena. Um, we work, we work in the private arena. The state, the state is very competitive. I mean, you may go to a walkthrough on a federal contract. There's six, maybe seven guys there. You go to a state project, could be 18, could be 15, could be 19. It's, it's very competitive. So at the end of the day, um, we work in the private arena, um, because in the 8A program, you have to do, when your fifth year, you have to do like 25%, your sixth year, 35, and, you know, it goes up. So um, most of our non-8A work has come from the private arena. But we are looking at some state projects right now that we're, that we're going to pursue. But in the past, the past six years, we haven't. Okay. Okay. Um, I, I'll say this. If someone shared this with me. Uh, I know that you used the, the you said it was it was competitive, but I think that what I've found for me in the the city work and some of those state contracts, like you said, if you have eighteen people there, someone's going to miss something, right? If you had a, a class out of eighteen students, someone's going to get an A, someone's going to get an F. Well, you don't want the low guy who just a low price, maybe the F guy, and you don't want to use that as a bar. Um, yes, but when you work on the state level the lowest qualified bidder wins. Right. So if this guy has vetted and he's proven to the state, because we have 
in Massachusetts, what we call DCAM, Division of Ca um, Capital Assets Management, which you have to be certified um, to do state work. Mm -hmm. Once that person is certified, if he's the lowest bidder, then he gets the job. In the federal arena, it doesn't always work like that. Um, if your background is a little flaky and um, there's some things that was unacceptable that you've done in the past, um, they have the ability to go to the next guy. Mm -hmm. Some agencies do it more than others. Right. But, you know, your background, your performance, all that plays a part Part as far as you went in a competitive contract. Right, 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 right. The so state, then, lowest bidder wins. Lowest bidder, right. So it doesn't matter, you know, how great he is or not great or if he missed something. Right, right. So, um, and even in the um, federal arena, I call it the Texas wild card. You could have three local guys bidding on a project and the fourth is some guy out of Texas and he comes in low bidder and if he's legit, you know, he wins the contract. So, um, yeah, I, that's the I've beauty that. of the, that's the beauty of the 8A program because you have time to develop your business and, um, work all these issues out. And when you graduate, you're in position to compete on a federal level as well as private and state. Right. If you can do a federal job, there's not much out there you can't do. Now, why do you say that? Tell me why. Can you expound upon that idea? Let's just say you're doing a simple project for the government. Um, you still need your submittals. Um, you still have to submit your RFIs. The level of administration is still held at a certain level, whether you're doing a $200,000 job or you're doing a $3 million job. The process is still the same. Um, so if you're doing a $300,000 job for a private person, they don't really have the administrative um, requirements that you would have working for the government. So at the end of the day, um, you become more, you're on top of your game more when you work for the government. And it seems like when you do the private or state jobs, it's a lot easier because mm -hmm. you don't have the administrative mandates that you have for the government. Right, 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 at the federal level. Yeah, we, we call it the head of the snake. It's the paperwork. Right, right, and you're familiar with it. Um, it it's, um, and oh, it's, once you learn it, once you learn it, it's, it's like a machine, you know, you just right. pump it out, you know, you know what to expect. You know, you, you may get a curveball um, asking for a, a different plan that you weren't expecting, um, but at the end of the day, um, it's, pretty, it's pretty much cookie cutter. Right. Right. Yeah, no, I, I, right. yeah, no, I, I would agree with that. I would agree with that assessment. Um, now, how did you handle the issue of growing out your bonding when you started in construction? Well, I had been working with a bonding company before I got in the 8 program. And um, the bonding company was familiar with the 8 program. And um, basically, um, we worked together. Um, there was a relationship before. So they would stick their neck out a little further than someone that they didn't know. So as the jobs, as the jobs came in and as well as the jobs were completed, um, there was more and more trust built as well as, you know, your assets grow. So at the end of the day, um, the bonding company that we have grew with us as the contracts grew. And it was great because basically talking to other 8 a contractors that graduated, that was one of the issues. Yeah. You may be able to do the work, Brian, but if you don't have the bonding, then mm -hmm. it's, it doesn't matter. So right. that was one of the arenas that I addressed before I even got in the program, talking to my bonding agent and he said, Brian, we'll work with you. Um, um, we all have our requirements, but you know, we're willing to work with you. And that's, that's how we got to the point where we are today. No, cause I see again, um, your numbers, you know, increase, I don't know, 500% or whatever, 300%. That takes a lot, especially with the government cycle times to, to grow your bonding that much to sustain that. Um, that's not an easy process to do. No, it's not. And, um, at the end of the day, um, 
that's one of the biggest challenges as far as any business that's doing right. public work is bonding. Right. You know, whether you're in the 8A arena or you're in the state arena or private arena, you know, bonding is really something that um, can hold you back if you don't have um, the proper bonding. Right, right, right. Uh, it, did you find, I see in looking at your history, you've done a lot of work with national parks, uh, but you've also done USDA and DOD, like you mentioned, the Navy, the Air Force. Do you find the process of working with them are all the same or is it there are differences or is there anything that keeps differences that you could mention? Well, each customer is unique. Um, the National Park Service, they are um, very 8A friendly. Um, the DOD, um, the local Air Force, um, they're 8A friendly. Um, the Navy tends to want you to prove yourself. Um, they like for you to, to compete on the open market. They like to see where your prices are. And then, you know, if you're competitive in the um, open market, then they'll set aside a project for you. Um, the USDA, that was a eight, that was an 8 a competitive. That was kind of like a wild card that came out at the last minute. Um, we competed against four other um, 8 a contractors and won that particular contract. So that's been a successful contract. Um, all the different agencies are, are different, but it's getting to know um, what that particular agency is looking for and then just meeting their needs, you know. Um, marketing is very important. I mean, you may go to a, speak to an agency and, you know, you introduce yourself and um, you bring your literature and you present it to them and it's like, okay, thanks a lot. It was nice meeting you and you may never hear from them again. Um, so marketing is key. Certification doesn't mean that you're going to win a contract. You and I both know that. Um, yeah. There's a few 8As that I know that haven't won a contract yet. And at the end of the day, it's unfortunate, but these things does happen. And right. um, I think the biggest key is marketing. Have you, have you ever spent any time in D.C.? Has that been part of your marketing strategy or plan at all? Um, no, I haven't. Okay. Um, that's something that I haven't done. Okay. And due to COVID, it was something I was thinking about before COVID, but um, since COVID, COVID has changed the um, arena somewhat. Right. No, for everyone out here. The, going back to marketing, I know you mentioned earlier the BOS uh, and your SBA office in Boston. Have you ever had to reach out to any senior levels at the SBA or just at the level with your BOS and the, the, your local office? I've spoke with the director. I've spoke with all levels and, and um, they're great. Um, they really um, like working with the eight A's. Um, they make themselves, they make themselves available. Um, I've spoke with the director. Um, I spoke with my BOS. Um, basically you want to build a relationship because at the end of the day, when the agencies call, they can't just recommend one contractor, but um, you definitely want your name thrown in the hat. So to have that relationship is only beneficial to you, especially if you're out there um, making all your customers happy. In the beginning, you said there was two of you working and you're doing all the RFIs, all the paperwork, all the administrative stuff. Did you have any spare time? Not really. Um, <laughs> it was, you know, it was, it was very challenging, but at the end of the day, um, it was worth it. Um, sometime when you're a business owner, you, you think that you can do more than, you know, um, you can, then you can do more and, and you try to, I would say reserve from hiring someone because you think you can do it yourself. But at this point, I don't think that's the best strategy. Um, and in the beginning, I was a little cautious because you don't really know what direction your 8A is going to go. So let's be cautious. Let's be conservative. Let's just go at this um, very conservatively. But the t the clock ticks and you can't, you you know, you while you're in here doing all these administrative things, you should be out there selling your business out there, you know, reaching out to contract officers. So it got to the point where in the first two years, I'm like, you know, we were building out in the field. You know, I was hiring more superintendents, more laborers, more people out in the field. But um, as the contracts grew, 
then you can't do it all. And that's when I started bringing in people um, to try to help and assist and, and really take lead um, and help grow the business. No, that's, that's a really good point. Um, I know that you said that you didn't actually, you haven't done any formal trainings. Uh, what about your team members? Are there any type of entrepreneurship trainings, leadership trainings, things that you've sent them to that you may want to recommend to people listening to this? Well, that's something that, um, that's something that I haven't done or I've sent. I mean, we go through the, um, typical trainings that, you know, the government, we go to, um, we go to the, um, seminars, okay. but as far as training, um, we haven't really, um, pursued any training and that's, that's my fault. Okay. No, well, I mean, again, you've still managed to do uh, a large volume of work without it. I just, just want to know if there was any type of resources that you recommended to people it was more the, the purpose of the question. Yeah. I'm kind of, yeah, no, that's okay. Um, what do you think the, you know, again, we talked about some of the other 8As out there that are not winning work. What do you think that it, it is that they're not doing? Why are they not winning work? I think one of the biggest issues, and it's not all construction, there's different no, sure. branches, but um, I think it's just the marketing aspect. And it's, it's not something that I really took um, that serious because some of the other graduates, you know, when they became 8A, automatically their phones started ringing off the hook. But we both know today that's not the case. So um, reaching out to contract officers, um, going out, having conversations, it's a little more difficult now or pretty much impossible to do with COVID, but making phone calls, just really selling your business and um, showing what you have to offer. And once you make that connection and get that first contract, proving yourself. You know, I have a motto. I'm going to treat you like you're my only customer. And you're not my only customer, but at the end of the day, I want you to feel like, you know, wow, I'm his only customer. So just give them that, that type of, um, how would you put it? That type of type of work ethic that they really feel comfortable and that, you know, when they have to make a choice of picking an 8A contractor, that you're at the top of the list. Makes sense, makes sense. Any other famous quotes or sayings that you, uh, that you operate by? Well, that's, that's, that's pretty much the one that I live by. And I even tell them, I say, I'm gonna treat you like you're my only customer. You're not my only customer, but I'm gonna try my best to treat you like you're my only customer. And um, that's really, um, once I put that statement out there, then I have to live up to it, right. you know? So right. going the extra mile doesn't hurt. That goes, that, no, that goes a long way. Uh, how do you handle stress, exercise, meditation, yoga? Not well, not well. Um, as a business owner, you're always looking for the next opportunity. You're always trying to make sure that you don't miss anything. Um, you wear many different hats. Um, you're out marketing, you're, you're doing sales. Um, you know, I may be servicing some equipment. Um, you know, I may be on the weekend, you know, um, planning for another job. So mm -hmm. stress is, I'll put it to you like this. A gentleman told me this construction is like a pressure cooker. Everything looks good on the outside. But on the inside, tenderizing, you're just being tossed over. So my outlet is, you know, spending family time, going on vacations, doing things with my family, and not just letting the business overwhelm me. But I didn't think much of that comment when the gentleman told me that, but I found it to Today? be true. Today, you right. You see differently. Construction is a pressure cooker. I mean, you re it, it really takes a toll on your body, mentally and physically. Right. Wow. Um, where do you seek out places for, for inspiration for yourself? Well, um, first of all, I, I, I believe in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, and um, he, he guides me through um, my life full circle. Um, spending time with the family, um, 
just being able to, when you're on vacation, you sit back and reflect and you take a look at what's valuable and what's not valuable. We all have our goals that we want to reach in life. We all want to put our best foot forward and, and be the best we can be. But at the end of the day, we don't want to be consumed by what we're doing and we want to still be able to enjoy life. So you have to find that happy medium and, you know, it's not always chasing the buck, you know, the buck's going to be out there, but um, success is not based on how much money you make or how big you grow. Success is something that you have to look at internally. I, I would agree. I agree hundred um, percent. So you talked about vacations. Tell me something that's brought you overwhelming joy in the last six months. Wow. Just seeing my daughter get her driver's license. Oh, um, man, that's going to be neat. <laughs> um, my son was accepted to play AAU basketball, but he never got a chance because COVID set in. Uh, just some of the simple things in life, yeah. you know, um, just seeing your family grow and just um, being a, a friend to people when they're in need. Um, mostly the things that are outside of um, – working, you know, just the simple things in life. Right. right. Those are the things that bring me pleasure. And, and again, I, it's great that um, it humanizes people because again, oftentimes we talk only about the work portion, but I think the family is uh, what helps some of that balance. So that's good. Yes. Um, I've seen contracts in the past just try to be so successful and sacrifice their families. And a lot of times they end up in divorce and all these different negative issues. And that's something um, that I always had to keep balanced because I, I didn't want to be that person. Um, Cause at the end of the day, um, there are other things that bring happiness besides successful business. Successful business is great, but you know, um, there's more to life than just making a dollar. All right. I would agree. I'd agree. Do you, um, do you shop on Amazon? Yes. Okay. What's the uh, last thing that you bought from Amazon that was pretty rewarding for you? Well, this is going to be kind of weird, but that's okay. That's why I asked the question. This, this is not going to be, um, <laughs> my mom used to make um, buckwheat pancakes okay. and um, it's a Southern thing. And, I was talking to my kids about buckwheat pancakes and, you know, well, dad, why don't you go out and buy some? So I went to all the different stores and there's no buckwheat pancakes on the shelf. So I went on Amazon and I found some. And um, as a matter of fact, they came in a week ago and I haven't cooked them yet, but uh -huh. at the end of the day, um, just making those buckwheat pancakes, um, I look forward to it. And it's just simple things like that. Um, now, now not, tell not, us. I'm sorry to cut you off. Tell me about the buckwheat pancakes. I don't want you to get off to get off of that. Tell me about them. What were you telling your kids well, about buckwheat pancakes? Well, I'm like, you know, they, they, I said there's a different pancake out there. There's buckwheat pancakes. They're healthy. Um, I say I like them more than the regular pancakes. And mm. you know, my kids are 17 and 12, and they're like, oh, dad, we never seen no buckwheat pancakes. And you know, just conversation with your kids, and it's like, well, why don't you make us some? Why don't you um why don't you, um, um, cause let's face it, I'm the head cook in the house. So I was really excited about finding these buckwheat pancakes and to my, you know, I haven't seen them on the shelf for years and I went to look for them and it, nobody cares them anymore. So I just wanted to, um, just share some of the things that I remember growing up as far as with my parents, um, try to share with them different experiences, um, different frame of mind, you know, you try to teach them and raise them to be independent and to have a self-worth. You have value and don't let anyone depreciate you. And the relationships and these type of incidents help build the character of your children. So right. that's, that's, that's where I stand. I've never heard of buckwheat pancakes. What are they? What do they taste like? What, how do they taste? I guess I know you said it's different. I wonder. Well, it's wheat. It's, it's ah, wheat. It's a wheat a pancake. Wheat. It's a wheat, just like you have white bread mm -hmm. and you have wheat bread. Um, buckwheat pancakes are a wheat pancake. And 
you probably have a better chance of um, finding them in Florida, in Florida than right. well in Massachusetts. Um, and I don't even know if they were popular in Massachusetts um, Ever. Back, in the, back in the 60s or 70s when I was eating them. So, um, but it was popular down south, and they're probably on the shelf down south. But what kind of syrup the, do you use on the pancakes? Well, that's another conversation. Uh, I, well, I'll tell you. Okay, I'll tell, I'll start first. I use uh, alga. You ever heard of alga? A L G A. Alga. It's alga. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's we really grew up thick. on it. It's real it's thick, thick, like corn syrup. It's uh-huh. amazing you said that because I had this conversation with my family yesterday. Um, we were talking about um, me making the pancakes, and um, I grew up on alga and Aunt your mama. Okay. But See. At this point. I like Mrs. Butterworth. Get out of here. And my kids, my kids love Mrs. Butterworth. But Have they try um, Alaga. They they said it's too thick. It's just too <laughs> sticky. It's just it's just you know. Uh, I tr- I tried to share it with them, but they just don't like it. And it's not popular up north. When I go down south, you know, I picked up a couple bottles and I brought it back, and I thought it was going to be a hot item, and they were like, "Nope, nope, nope, nope. We'll stick to Miss Butterworth." So. Yeah, I guess you got to get used to it. I I, I liked it. I, it's funny because they say it's thick, then I think the the other stuff is too thin. Right. I think it's, it's just, um, something that's very popular in the South and most people up North that come from the South is familiar with alaga syrup and my kids didn't like it. And I ended up giving the other bottle away and the guy loved it, but he was from the South. Okay. Okay. All right. That makes sense. Um, Tell us about an odd place that you work or a job that you had that maybe someone would never guess. Well, um, growing up in Green Cove Springs, um, it wasn't too far from St. Augustine. And my first job was working at a crab factory. Um, You said odd, so this is very odd. Okay. So the factory was on the shore and the boats would go out and catch the crabs. And they had this huge boiling pot that they would pour the crabs in and it would boil the crabs. So after the cat crabs would boil, the, you, they would put them on this huge table and you would pick the crab meat out of it. And you would get paid probably $2.75 for a pint of crab meat that was picked. And the place smelled pretty indifferent. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't a great, it was a summer job. This was a job okay. when I was in high school, it was a summer job. So the people there didn't make a lot of money, but I was ambitious and I wanted to make some money. So the bus would come pick you up and you get on the crab bus and you ride to St. Augustine and you work eight hours and they give you a ride back. So um, those type of jobs, um, create memories and it creates a work ethic because Mm -hmm. you're not getting paid a lot of money but at the end of the day you want to earn some money for yourself and your parents didn't have money to give you so Mm -hmm. this was a way to um create pocket money and i did it for a whole summer so the so the how far was the distance from your place to st augustine it was probably like 12 13 miles okay 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 wow wasn't far all right. So then how, how what was the process like to get the crab meat out? Well, you had to pop the crab open and there's not a lot of good meat in the crab. You had right. to pick the crab meat out and put it in the pint and, you know, your fingers would get pricked, you know, mm. the, you know, it was very, it was very tedious. It was boring. It was, and it's, it takes a while to get a pint of crab meat. I mean, you would work probably two hours just to get one pint. Oh, really? I, I was going to yeah. ask that. Wow. Yeah, it was. So not one crab doesn't produce one pint. No, no way. No way. I don't even, I guess I got to figure out how much a pint is. Huh. I mean, it was, it was, it took me like, I was a child, but it took me like two, two and a half hours to get a pint. I remember my first day, I probably made like eight bucks. And this was back, this was back in the seventies. I mean, this was, this was, this was the mid, this was the mid seventies. So, um, how old were you? It, how old were you when you were working I was, there? I was about 15 or 16, okay. right. somewhere 15, 16. Okay. So you had a summer job as a, you know, a teenager. Okay. Picking crabs. Picking crabs. I love it. I love it. As I, well 
well, I don't know. When I was in college, I had a, jo- a job in um, making tampons. Come on. Yes, 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 yes. I worked at a tam. I, I worked for Tam Brands. It was a local. It was only. It's in. Um, it's only like ten miles up the road. Mm-hmm. Yep, I had a summer job working at Tam Brands making tampons. Um, and what did I you was, have to do? I ran a machine. Um, the machine made the tampons. You had to. Um, supply the machine with the materials, the cotton, the string, and you just made sure the machine ran and you kept it going. So we had to produce like over 20,000 tampons a night. So um, it wasn't something that I bragged about, but all these things build character. That's really neat. That's because really you got to realize there weren't a lot of jobs no. um, where I grew up at, you know, we had one Win Dixie, we had one AMP, we had one high school, we had one, we only had one or anything, one general store. So, um, being a minority growing up in a southern town, it's just, it, it just weren't a lot of opportunities. Right, 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 right. That's fair. That's fair. Brian, well, I tell you what, I've enjoyed the conversation. I, uh, I, I especially like hearing the last two stories. <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot of people, they can, they're going to be able to draw a lot of nuggets out of here. I mean, I have a full page of notes myself that I was writing the whole time from, you know, working, uh, watching the person build your house up to going to community college, the trials and error of running a business. So I can tell you, I've, I've definitely gained a lot from today. But before we close out, there's something that you want to leave people with um, and as upcoming, inspiring entrepreneurs the future generations of companies, MBEs, business owners out there in the world? Well, from my experience in life, no matter what you're doing, surround yourself, surround yourself around successful people and people that are going to help you grow. Um, and don't be afraid to help someone when you get to the point where you're able to help someone. It's one thing I, um, I've always learned that, you know, there's many people that have inspired me and helped me to be who I am today. And these people that helped me, um, they probably, once once I became successful or able to help someone else, you probably won't be able to help those people because they're already successful, Mm -hmm. but you can help someone else. And that's the connection that we need to make because um, a lot of times we just want to help the people that helped us. And that's not, that's not going to build growth. That's not going to build um, who we are today. Um, once we become where we need to be, we need to reach back and help other people. And that's, that's something that I, I do regularly. Is there, where's the best way for people to reach out to you? Um, Your website? They can reach me by my website. Um, they can call the office. Um, if anyone has any questions, um, just call my office, Henry General Contractors, Inc., 413-301-5655. Ask for me, and um, I will answer the phone. And its website is henrygeneralcontractors.com. We will have that on our show notes, uh, as always, following this particular podcast interview. Uh, Henry Jones, I'm sorry, hold on. I'm looking at one thing. HenryGeneralContractors.com says Henry H E N R Y General G E N E R A L Contractors.com out of Springfield, Mass. Brian, well, listen, Brian, thank you so much for coming on today. I know um, we've been talking about it for probably, has it been a year? Not yet. Not yet. Okay, close enough. I think with COVID, it makes all the time feel so much like greater. Exactly. And thank you. <laughs> thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, no, definitely. Now, speaking of that, before we let you go, is there something that we can help you with here at GovCon Giants? Um, that's a discussion that we can have. Um, okay. Just, just give me a call and um, let me know, and I'm, I'm, I'm definitely interested. Um, okay. Well, do me a favor. Let's close out for today. Uh, we'll say our goodbyes, and then we'll stay on the call for a couple minutes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Thanks for coming back. Just a few things before we wrap up today. We are currently making government contracting available to everyone. And with that said, we have reopened the window for those persons wanting to join our community and our organization. We have re-released GovCon Giants 1.0, which is a 18 packed modules that take you from the post SAM registration, submitting a proposal and estimating your bid. Join us over at GovCon EDU today for more information. If you have any questions, give us a call 786-477-0000. 
0477. If you have already not left us a five-star review, please do so today. We are actively pursuing 100 five-star reviews and need your help. We do not have sponsors and everything that we do is funded by support from people like yourself. So please, if you don't have monies, at least you can show us your appreciation by giving us a five-star review on iTunes. This will help grow our channel, community, and allow us to further our cause. As always, the book recommendations, show notes, and other valuable tips and resources from today's episode will be on our website at govcongiants.com forward slash podcast. Stay safe and happy holidays. Mm-hmm.